three seats. And then there's three seats. So I'm I'm not sure whether to be happy or sad that we're full to the rafters upstairs and the fire regulations, albeit European Union fire regulations, no they are, won't let any more people in. Uh, but it's, I must say, I've been on the road now uh, for 48 hours. We did a meeting in Cornwall, one in Somerset, one in Devon, uh, one in Gloucestershire, now one here, and we're heading up north tomorrow. And, and what's been astonishing is absolutely everywhere we go, we can't get everybody into the venues. And that's got to be good news, because it shows something is going on in this country. There is a common sense revolution beginning in British politics, and it's happening firstly because I think the things that UKIP stands up and say are what most of us in our hearts feel is, is the right thing for this country. Above all, that the only people that should govern Britain should be the British people themselves, through the ballot box, and not bureaucrats based in Brussels or the European Court in Strasbourg or anywhere else. We should govern our own country. <laughs> and this is not just some academic debate. It's a debate about why are we giving away £53 million a day to Brussels when the economy is tough in this country. It's about why our 75% of our laws now made somewhere else, and that we in a general election, regardless of who we vote for, cannot change one of them. And it's really becoming about being a member of the European Union means we cannot control our own borders. We can't decide who comes to live, work or settle in this country. Now, we as a country have been the most welcoming and open country in Europe when it's come to refugees, when it's come to people who are immigrants to this country. We've had the best race relations of any country in Europe. And the reason for that, I think, is, firstly, we're not a bad lot, and secondly, because we had a managed migration policy from 1950 onwards, where 30 to 50,000 people a year came into a population of, of 60 million, um, and those numbers were not so big that people weren't able to assimilate. But what has happened since 97, since Blair got in, and in particular, what has happened since 2004, when we opened up the EU to some very poor countries in Eastern Europe, is that immigration into Britain has been running at nearly half a million people a year. Even the official census showed that four million extra people in the last 10 years had settled here, and that's without the number of illegal immigrants, which we all know, once they come to Britain, very little ever gets done to remove them. And one of the issues that we flagged up in this county election campaign is that a big increase in population means increased pressure on all public services. It means primary school places, it means GP appointments, it means pressure on the police, pressure on the fire services. And what we're saying is, as a party, we do not believe that it's right and fair to open our doors next year, on January the 1st, to 29 million people from Romania and Bulgaria. These countries are very much poorer than Poland, Latvia, Lithuania and the last wave that joined. Something like 44% of the Bulgarian population is living below the poverty line, so much so they can't even afford to heat their houses in what's been a very cold winter. Now I want to make it clear. We have got nothing against people from Romania and Bulgaria. And indeed, if I was a young Bulgarian, I'd be packing my suitcase now and looking to come for a better life in Britain. But there's a limit. There has to be a limit to the number of people we're prepared to allow into this country. Youth unemployment in 2004 was 600,000 in Britain. Youth unemployment today is just under 1 million. And that is because we have a huge oversupply of the unskilled labour market in this country. That doesn't make sense. And even worse, I think, is the fact that the social security rules have changed. In 2004, you had to be here for a year and pay your stamp before you could qualify for benefits. Now, you can come into Britain from Eastern Europe, say you're self-employed and seeking work, and you can get job seekers allowance on day one, housing benefit within a fortnight, 
And our message is that nobody should be able to claim benefit in this country until they've been here for a minimum of five years, paid their taxes, obeyed the law, and then and only then should they be able to access the benefit system, because that benefit system is something uh, that many families, many millions of families, have now paid into for, for generations, and surely it's time that we started to put the interests of the British people first. Now, it's funny, because uh, for many, many years, we were told we weren't allowed to even debate this subject. That it was wrong to even discuss it. And I sense that a former West Midlands Conservative MP perhaps caused a bit of this trouble. Uh, that perhaps uh, the language that Enoch Powell used did actually frighten people off from even wanting to debate this as a subject. And that lasted for decades. Uh, and indeed, from 2004 onwards, when we pointed out that you can't have your own immigration policy and be a member of the European Union, we've been called some pretty nasty things. In fact, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, has said we're closet racists because we even want to discuss the issue. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not closet racists. We welcome people under a managed migration policy to come and settle in this country and to become part of our culture, but what we do not accept is that open door immigration is a good thing for this country. And, and that, that argument has been so powerful that over the last month there's almost been a bidding war going on between Clegg, Miliband and Cameron as to who could be the toughest on this issue. Amazing. They now think they should be discussing this. But in a sense, we've now got them playing with us on a pitch where only we can see the goal. Because they can analyse, they can raise the fears and concerns that many of you may have, but all the while they're committed to membership of this union, they cannot provide a solution. And the only way we get back border controls is by divorcing ourselves from political union. And let's, you know, and certainly those of you here over the age of 55, you all had a vote on this, didn't you, back in 1975? And what was it you voted for? To be part of a common market. One or two no voters here who saw through it. Um, but most people, sir, didn't see through it. Most people believed, just as my mum and dad did, most people believed what the politicians told them, that there was nothing to worry about, it was just about trade. Well, I want to make it clear. I want us to have a good relationship with Europe, and I want it to be based on trade. Of course I do. It would, 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 would be crazy not to. I want us to be good next door neighbours. But I don't just want Britain out of the European Union, I want the rest of Europe out of the European Union too. Because it isn't doing them much good, is it? In Greece, and Cyprus, and Portugal, and Spain, and indeed even in Ireland. Now, in the past, UKIP has been a party that people have lent their votes to in European elections. And indeed, in the European elections of 2009, we came second across the entire United Kingdom, beating Gordon Brown's Labour Party into third. And he looked even more miserable the next day than he normally did. <laughs> but we've struggled to get people to vote for us in big numbers in local elections and national elections. But I believe all of that has now changed. Some of you might have noticed there was a by-election in a place called Eastleigh the other week. And we nearly won it. We came within a whisker of winning it. We couldn't quite overhaul the Lib Dem postal vote. But I don't think after Eastleigh, anyone's going to tell you that a vote for UKIP is a wasted vote. It's not. And right across the country, in the last few weeks, we've, we've started winning town council by-elections and district council by-elections. And here in Worcestershire, on May the 2nd, of the 57 divisions that are up for election, there are 50 UKIP candidates. So virtually everybody in Worcestershire is going to have the opportunity to go out on May the 2nd and vote for us. And I'm asking you to vote for us, to vote for men and women of independent thought and mind, men and women who are not part of the normal career path that politics seems to follow these days. You know what I mean all go to the same schools, all go to the same Oxbridge colleges, 
all leave university and get a job as a researcher. No, we're putting up people from real life, uh, and I hope that establishing bridgeheads on county councils like Worcestershire, uh, that what we'll be able to do is to expose some of the nonsenses that are going on. You know, we all know we're living in straitened times. How is it then that the pay of senior council officials has exploded over the last decade? Far too many people paid far too much money at council level. And I want UKIP councillors in Worcestershire to find out how many climate change officers are there. How much money is being spent on interpretation of Eastern European languages? You know, how much money is actually being wasted? So we've got to try and focus all we can on maintaining the front line, but exposing you know, a lot of the fat, a lot of the waste that's going on at council level. I also think that it's very important in every county in this country to get UKIP councillors because of the absolute madness that has been put on this country as a result of agreements signed in Brussels committing us to producing 20% of our electricity by 2020 from renewable energy. Now, in theory, it sounds terrific until you see just how ugly and you realise just how useless this wind turbine project is. And if we're to meet our targets, we're going to need to build another 20,000 of them between now and 2020. And we are the only party clearly and absolutely unequivocally opposed to the building of wind farms. Not a debate about whether they're here or there. We don't believe the things should be built. We know they don't work. We know they have to be backed up by conventional energy. And we know who's paying for all of this. It's all of you. It's all of you. You are paying a 12% surcharge on your electricity bill to fund renewable energy. And where does the money go? Well, it goes to people like David Cameron's father-in-law, Sir Reginald Sheffield, who is being paid a thousand pounds a day just for citing wind turbines on his land in North Lincolnshire. So I absolutely promise you that UK councillors will campaign against this and have exposed this madness. And I also think that whilst we've lost faith with politics at national level, that increasingly we've lost faith with politics at local level too. It is quite difficult to distinguish the political parties these days. And a feeling that almost whoever gets onto the county council, it won't really make much difference. Uh, that in many cases they'll make decisions that virtually nobody wants. And in other cases, they'll get overruled on big planning decisions by national government. And much as we want to have a referendum on our relationship with the European Union, we also think that it's right and proper that when it comes to major decisions at county level, pe people's views should not be right over roughshod, but we should have the ability to force referendums at county level too, so that you can have your say on really big issues that affect your county, and you think councillors will fight for that too. I am confident that we're going to get a very healthy average percentage of the score. But we need to do better than that. We need to start winning some of these county council seats. We need to start establishing a bridgehead into local government. And I hope, <coughs> once we've done that, that our councillors will do what I've tried to do in the European Parliament from a small base, and that's to expose some of the nonsense uh, that we've had uh, over the last few years. I, of course, as you know, in my interventions in Brussels and Strasbourg, have always been polite and helpful at all times. <laughs> that had always been the view of my opponents. Uh, but I, I, I think at least uh, through YouTube and everything else, we've managed to get that UKIP message out. Uh, now, what I'm going to do is take a few quick questions before I go up to the second public meeting. Thank you very much for listening. We do not, let me be absolutely clear, sir, we do not wish to be a member of political union with Europe. We want to amicably divorce ourselves from the political union and to replace that with a genuine free trade agreement, which is what this country thought it was signing up to in the first place. In what form of 
words would you think would be appropriate for um, a referendum? And how would you overcome the legislative and political uh, restraints? Well, I mean, clearly the wording of a referendum is, is key. It has to be neutral. Um, I would suggest something like, uh, do you, live to, do you live to, uh, wish to live in a free sovereign country or in penal servitude? And put something like that. <laughs> I mean, I mean, to be honest, to be honest, you put your finger on a very important question. Because I think what Cameron plans to do, uh, we may have some booklets here on the subject, I think what Cameron plans to do is to, is to try to put on the British people the same conjure that Wilson did back in 75. Because Wilson had a renegotiation and then asked us to approve the renegotiated package, even though in reality he'd achieved almost nothing. Um, and I think that's Cameron's intention. However, uh, Cameron isn't going to win the next general election, point one. Point two, there'll be no renegotiation because nobody else wants it. Um, but perhaps, uh, most importantly, point three, I'm not prepared to wait until the end of 2017 for some vague promise that the man who previously had given us a cast iron guarantee on the Lisbon Treaty will this time deliver. I don't trust him and I don't believe him. Young man there. What's your position on the voting rights, especially given the recent case in the European Court of Justice regarding Italy? On voting rights? For prisoners. I think that if you lose your liberty, and are sent to prison for a period of time, that should also include a temporary suspension of your democratic rights as well. I do not believe it is right that prisoners should have the vote under any circumstances. On your one trick pony, you play everything on immigration, that's the reality of your policy. It seems to me that immigration is a big thing. I understand what you're saying about immigration and for sure the EU is an undemocratic institution. <coughs> but the reality is, the system is based on capitalists. You're a capitalist, aren't you not? Are you a capitalist, Nigel? Do I believe in free markets or, no, no. or the socialist <laughs> state? Do you, believe, do you believe in capitalism? Ask me one question, I'll answer it. We haven't got time for those. Right, I'll ask somebody else if you're not going to behave. What's your policy on trade unions? <laughs> What's our policy on What's trade unions? Your policy on trade unions and workers' rights? Very interestingly, yeah, very interestingly, Thank you. as we've increased workers' rights, yeah. maternity so leave. Against workers, are you? Yeah. Well, well clearly, if you're, if you're not going to be polite, I shan't bother with you. But I'll make this point to you. I'll make this point to you. We all think, when it comes to employment, that we're talking about big companies, and we forget, and we forget that 60 percent of people employed in Britain are employed in companies that employ less than 10 staff. And the big problem with employees' rights and protections is that it doesn't just apply to the giant multinationals, it applies to the small firms as well. And I would very much like us to free up, free up the labour market so that Britain's 4.2 small million businesses are no longer afraid to take on school leavers. If just one in four, if just one in four of Britain's small businesses gave the young people a chance, we would solve the youth unemployment problem in this country. Time is running out. Time is running out. I've got to go upstairs and answer some questions to give a speech up there. Can I thank everyone for coming and can I apologise? You couldn't all get in. Thank you very much.